Lynn Rendell. I'm a lifelong resident of Berwick. Always have been. The only time I ever left Berwick is when the military sent me wherever they wanted me to go. I uh, spent 24 years in the Army National Guard, both active duty and weekends. Um, been there for 24 years. Uh, the big thing about today was when I joined the military in 1975, my first assignment was with a battalion that had just returned from Vietnam after staying there for a year in 68 and 69, which was the Tet Offensive. And the Tet Offensive was brutal. That's where Walter Cronkite and all the news, you watched the war on TV. It wasn't like World War II, Korea. And that turned the tide with the American public against the Vietnam veteran. And they weren't treated well. They did what they were told, but they weren't treated well. And when I started serving with Vietnam veterans and listened to their stories, I knew there was an injustice stuff. And when this Recognition Act came out in 2017 by President Trump. I said, finally. Honor Guard, post the colors. Detail, head, butt, right shoulder, arm. Forward, march! Detail, pull. Post the column. My name is Paul Amatucci. I'm the first vice commander of the Charles S. Hatch Post 79 of the American Legion in Berwick, Maine. Today it is my honor to be here for our commander, Brian English, who could not be here. As we assemble here and talk about veterans this morning, Brian is taking care of them at VA medical facilities. So thank you for doing that, Brian. As we get started, I invite Pastor Brown to please come forward. Pastor Brown is the chaplain for VF W Post 5744, and thank you for the members of that post for joining us this morning. We greatly appreciate that. Uncover. Uh, please uh, join me in a word of prayer as we bow our heads now 
for a prayer for remembrance, by, especially for our Vietnam War uh, participants and their families. So it's about the prayer. Dear, gracious, merciful, and almighty God, we are gathered here today to pay tribute in remembrance of brave men and women, living and dead, who heeded the call of valor to our country and the United States military to a distant land called Vietnam. The price of freedom is never cheap, but brutally severe in the cost of lives permanent injury, and lasting effects of PTSD, Agent Orange, and blood that was spilled. Please accept our thanksgiving with grateful hearts for their sacrifices of heroism and the sacrifices of their families. Merciful Father, we ask that you send comfort and a healing touch to those who remain, and may they realize that by your grace, we will never take for granted their devotion in preserving our liberty. O oh Lord, in your mercy, have compassion on us and make us a generation with grateful hearts, full of wisdom, discipline, and good faith towards you and our fellow man. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Cover. Thank everybody for uh, being here. And we started out about 9:30 up at uh, the Veterans Park. And uh, although we are all tough veterans and friends of veterans here, uh, this is a lot warmer and a lot less windy. So uh, thanks for adjusting to the change of venue. So we're here today to remember and give thanks to our Vietnam veterans. Many of us present served in country or in a vital support capacity elsewhere. Today we are not only here to honor and memorialize the 58,000 brothers and sisters who gave everything, but to all U.S. military who are Vietnam veterans or Vietnam era veterans. As is commonly said, all gave some, but some gave all. Many here in this group saw considerable action and carry purple hearts with honor and our deep gratitude. But all who served made difficult and determined contributions that can never be passed over or minimized. The average age of the Vietnam veteran or the Vietnam soldier GI was 19 years old. 58,000 were killed in action. 300,000 were wounded in action. 2,300 missing in action. 3.4 million troops served in Southeast Asia, and 2.5 million of them served in country in Vietnam. The war dates were 5 August 1964 to 28 March 1973. This is why we are here today for every single one of them. Today we have, as our keynote speaker, Phil Jenks. Phil is currently our post adjunct and has been a post member for 13 years. He served in Vietnam as a hospital woman, second class, with the 10th Marine Recon of the 3rd Amphibious Battalion and Expeditionary Forces. He served two terms in Vietnam, 
and Southeast Asia at 68, 69, and 69 to 70. I'd like to welcome our, our keynote speaker, who, at his time in Vietnam, was awarded the Combat and Fleet Marine Force Medals, Navy and Marine Commendation for Valor, plus the Vietnam Service Medal. Phil, please. scouts here, and people of younger generations, uh, as to why we're here and why we were there. Um, back in the 50s, because there's still some younger generations here, but most of us would remember in the 50s and even the 60s, America was in a real anti-communist fever. Uh, we drilled to diving under our desks at school, which was going to do a lot of good when that atom bomb went off. But, uh, you know, it just was the thing at the time, and we were expanding our democratic uh, views to the world. Um, as one of the leaders of democracy, World War II had just ended some years before. The world was recovering, and Russia, then called the Soviet Union, or USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, um, had kept everything they liberated, turning them into a, a communist regimes, replacing a lot of the people who had been there. China, was expanding its communist uh, teachings of Mao, Tato, and uh, into Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and of course Vietnam. The Vietnamese had ousted the French, achieving their independence, but now there was this threat of communism moving downward from the north, led by, of course, Ho Chi Minh and such. And the president of the Republic of Vietnam had asked for American aid. Aid turned into advisors. Some, a lot of pilots went over and volunteered. We even lost some. Uh, so Americans were already committing themselves to something before any war commenced. Um, then, finally, it did commence, and we began to send troops, and the, the numbers increased and increased, and finally complete support uh, by air, by sea, by every means. Every branch of the military served there, inclu and including uh, Coast Guard, Merchant Marine, and other countries. Anzacs, which are Aussies and New Zealanders, sent some. Uh, South Korea, the rocks were there. Uh, we had others, uh, and of course the South Vietnamese Army, and then most of them were interpreters as well as combat uh, troops. Fierce fighting people. But then again, so were Americans. Uh, so, essentially, I don't really have to go through it all. I'm not going to relate any experiences or anything. What we did and what we experienced is, for each of us, is our memories that we had to deal with. Uh, learning to come back to society, a society that didn't want to accept us. Uh, we were scorned. We were ignored by our government, by our people. We were spit up. Some were beaten up. It just, some were just disappeared. 
It wasn't a very popular war. Protesting had crescendo to a maximum, and politicians began to follow the whole ruse of it all. The thing was, we were doing quite well over there. We were having victories, and we were making headway into territories that uh, the communists had held for quite a while. We were in Mekong, all the way up the river, quite a ways. Uh, as well as holding the delta and, and offshore, we had no competition. Our pilots did well. We took quite a few losses, but not as many as they did. In the field, far more Vietnamese perished than our troops. They still have tens of thousands missing and so forth. So, because things just weren't going well, and it just is, politics always wins out over military ambitions and successes, um, we left Vietnam in 73. And everybody kind of, I'm sure, remembers that little withdrawal. The last helicopter taken off from the embassy in Saigon there and everything, but uh, the thing was that all the millions that went through there, all the hundreds of thousands at a time going in as green replacements and so forth, everybody did their job, did their duty, and did it with excellence. Uh, so, why are we here today? Well, we're here to remember, to honor all of those who made this commitment. A lot of people went to the recruiters. The majority, they had always had this thing that it was a, everybody was drafted. That is not true at all. The majority, eight, over, almost 90% were volunteers. Forces. America has always volunteered. Starting way back in the French and Indian War. Something to be proud of. Uh, so we're here to remember and honor those. What I did, what made me really always feel there was hope and that we did do something. Uh, in spite of our having to leave there, was I got into a conversation one time with a group of other Vietnam vets that were working at this hospital I worked at, and a nurse who was an army nurse had been in a forward operating base there, um, and this doctor, we didn't know him. We thought he was just Vietnamese. Well, turned out he was from in the North Vietnamese Army, had been underground doing surgery and so forth, and in the tunnels and so forth for five years. Five years. He said he saw the light of day twice in five years. We inflicted heavy casualties in that area. And this was up near between, like, he was kind of vague as to where it was because he never was sure. He had to, they had to keep moving. Uh, but it was about in the north part uh, of our area there, uh, i core and all that, it was called. But uh, near Chulai and Quezon and all that area. And I would, we were talking and I just, they were talking about how many people we lost and da 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 and I wondered if they were ever going to do a memorial for us, for our losses. And I said, what a waste of American and Vietnamese lives. And he got actually mad. And he said, no. And let me read it, because um, I'll probably screw it up again. I actually wrote this down later, so I would never forget this. 
No, it was a noble cause that Americans would come all the way to Vietnam to fight and maybe lose their lives for our people and our freedom. No, it was not a waste. Well, yeah, there were tears. <laughs> um, and just then I got called back to the newborn intensive care unit. But, uh, so, um, it just gave me this, I had to think about it, and then I got home and I told my wife about it, and she said, well, of course, she began to cry. There was never a more supportive person for veterans than my wife. Man, she always, she was the one who brought me back. Uh, but um, she said, you know, it's what he's saying is that, you know, and he said, we have to honor all those who fought, no matter which side and stuff. And it just really got me. Um, as Paul said, millions served over there, whether it was onshore, offshore, support bases in the Pacific, anywhere from all the way across the entire Pacific, all the way from Alaska to Florida and New England to, well, Southern California, although sometimes it seemed more like Mexico when I lived there. Um, so, you know, it was a war that involved a lot of the world in spite of just being in this small Asian country. Russia was involved in it. Oh yeah, those guns weren't coming just from China. So, uh, we're here to honor them, to honor all of us. For some of us, it's the memories. And um, we did what our country asked us to do, and we did it, as I said before, well. And no matter how unpopular it was, we went. And both, and the, <laughs> I'm going to finish with a phrase that the doctor later sent me a note. He had me beeped, and he left a note. He had to go somewhere, and he left me a note. And uh, this was the note that he left me. Chet Trong Ha Song Dok. Better to die in honor than to live in disgrace. So, that concludes it. And I'm Boku proud to be among those vets. And I salute all of you. Thanks very much, Phil. And uh, I remember when I asked you to do this, uh, you had said, I'm not sure I'm going to do this. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the reason was uh, that, that you were asked was last year when we did this on the 29th, uh, uh, Borough Community TV did a recording as they're doing today. And when they did that, uh, they did some interviews afterwards, and Phil was one that they interviewed, and uh, it was very touching and moving, and I knew he had a lot to say, so thank you, Phil. I really appreciate that. Uh, just something else that, uh, that I thought would be appropriate is that uh, this is not only a, a national celebration, it's not a national holiday, but a national celebration of uh, Vietnam veterans, but it's also 
uh, official in Maine. And the governor, Governor Mills, uh, in 2020, uh, proclaimed that, uh, and I'm not going to read it all, but it says something that, uh, whereas having been denied a proper welcome home more than four decades ago, National Vietnam War Veterans Day commemorates <clears throat> the sacrifices of the men and women who served their country as well as their families. So, as, uh, as those of us who happen to have set foot on that Vietnamese soil, um, thank you for that. We're, uh, we're next going to invite up uh, Lynn Rendell, who is going to read names of those who have fallen in Vietnam from Maine. But, by the way, uh, Lynn is a retired Sergeant First Class U.S. Army National Guard with service from 1975 to 1999, active duty from 81 to 89, uh, and he's been a member of our American Legion post for over 40 years. Thank you. Thank you, Commander. Thank you for all showing up today. It's definitely an honor. It's definitely an honor to be standing here in uniform. Anytime I put my uniform on, it's out of respect for every soldier. During the height of the Vietnam War, 68 and 69, which was the turning point, I was 10 and 11 years old. When I turned 17, 16 years later, excuse me, six years later, <laughs> I joined a field artillery battalion that served in Vietnam from 68 to 69. They weren't that much older than I was. There's people in this crowd that were in the same battalion. And they took these 17, 18 year old kids like me and imparted on us their experiences, helped us put our field gear together, and I served with them for 24 years. I love them. I truly love them. Last year, even though the Vietnam War Recognition Act of 2017 Last year, in 2021, I had just got out of the hospital and my wife was going to get me a prescription. She'd come home. What are they doing downtown? I don't know. I didn't get the memo. We went up there and I had no idea a year ago today they had this recognition. And because I had served with so many Vietnam veterans, I said, finally, finally, a day where you can honor these soldiers. I had drank beer with them. I've heard their stories. I heard their stories over there. I heard their stories coming home. They weren't good, but they were good people. So I said, when we next have this ceremony, I'm going to be a part of it one way or another. I'll mow the grass, I'll shovel snow, I'll do anything. And I came up, did some research, in the state of Maine. Now you can't do this on Memorial Day, we don't have time. You can't do it on Veterans Day, we don't have time. But this is Vietnam. We have time. We're going to make time. In the state of Maine, 
We lost 338 soldiers, airmen, sailors, marines, everything. They come from 151 towns, hamlets, villages in the state of Maine. They were impacted. So I said to the commander, I can't do 338 names. Would you let me do 44 names a year for seven years? And if I'm still alive, I'll start over again. He says, who are So here we are. My wife will tell you, I'm going to give you the rank, the name, how old the soldier was, the city or town or hamlet he came from, and the date he died. I know how he died, and I've researched where he died. It's been an experience. Every, everybody in the state was affected. Because when I was reading this stuff, some cities and towns got handed. Some towns only lost one. Their population was 50. Put that in perspective. This is definitely an honor for me to do this. And it's long overdue. Alphabetically by town and handling. Sergeant Brian Leroy Bunker, age 20, Albion, Maine, 5 April 1970. Captain Gene Fletcher Matthews, age 25, Anson, Maine. 26 May 1967. PSC Robert Earl Godin, age 21, Ashland, Maine, 3 March 1969. Staff Sergeant Emery Norman Poitro, age 37, Ashland, Maine, 9 April 1968. First Sergeant James Crawford Skinner, age 43, Ashland, Maine, 26 October 1971. PFC William Russell Alman, age 20, Auburn, Maine, 30 July 1968. PFC Albert Lee Belanger, age 21, Auburn, Maine, 16 September 1969. PSC Michael Hubert DeShano, age 20, Auburn, Maine, 16 September 1968. PSC Bertrand Ronald Gagnon, age 21, Auburn, Maine, 22 August 1969. Corporal Alan Melvin Hutchinson, age 20, Auburn, Maine, 5 February 1970. Master Sergeant Bruce Irvin Latrell, age 35, Auburn, Maine. 20 May 1969. Sergeant Reginald Panfield Nicholas, age 29, Auburn, Maine, 3 October 1965. Staff Sergeant Peter George Bacchaeus, age 30, Auburn, Maine, 1 February 1966. Spec 5, Harold 
Everett Walker Jr., age 20, Auburn, Maine, 8 March 1968. Specialist 6, Richard W. W. Arnold, age 35, Augusta, Maine, 13 March 1966. Staff Sergeant Raymond Joseph Bashar, 25, Augusta, Maine, 9 March 1969. Sergeant Gilbert Stevens Bell, Jr., 21, Augusta, 13 December 1968. Corporal Norman Joseph Chevier, 19, Augusta, 21 July 1969. Specialist 5, Christopher Joseph Charles III, 30, Augusta, 9 May 1970, awarded the Bronze Staff of Valor in his last battle. Sergeant Richard James Goggin, 24, Augusta, Maine, 26 April 1971, we're halfway. Lance Corporal Edward Matty Kakelvin Jr., 18, Augusta, 29 October 1967. Specialist 4, Ronald Irving Kirkpatrick, 24, Augusta, 6 July 1969, won the Bronze Star Medal for Valor in his last battle. PFC Gregory Cornelius Quinn, 18, Augusta, 16, November 1967. Staff Sergeant Gilbert Craig Turner, Jr., 28, Augusta, 6, September 1969. Major William Francis Callanan, 36, Bangor, 11, November 1966. Specialist 4, Robert Dorian Cranston, 20, Bangor, Maine, 18 December 1970. Sergeant First Class, James Go George DeShano, 36, Bangor, 16 November 1968. PFC, David Bruce Farr, 21, Bangor, 6 February 1970. PFC Martin Lee Freeman, 21, Bangor, 3 March 1967, awarded the Bronze Star for Valor in his last battle. Sergeant William E. Jordan III, age 24, Bangor, 11 January 1966. Lance Corporal Edward Leonard Mann, Jr., 19, Bangor, 30 April 1968. Corporal Frederick W. McHugh, 21, Bangor, 8 September 1968. Sergeant James Bruce McLaughlin, 22, Bangor, 16 April 1971. Lieutenant Commander Walter Forrest Merrick, 46, Bangor, 26 October 1966. He was killed when a magnesium fire broke out on the aircraft carrier Riskany. 44 men were killed that day fighting that fire and their explosions. Not everybody got shot, but everybody were heroes. Staff Sergeant Charles Edgar Stewart, 34, Bangor, 19 May, 1966. Corporal Charles Edward Sullivan, Jr., 21, 29 July, 1967. PFC Thomas Michael Sullivan, 18, Bangor, 31 March 1967.
KFC, Peter Michael Umel, 18, Bangor, 10 April, 1968. Specialist 5, Nelson Grafton Richardson, 19, Bar Harbor, 4 February, 1971. KFC, Dennis Owen Crocker, 20, Bath, 16 August, 1968. Staff Sergeant Wayne Clifton Sire, 21, Bath, 7 May, 1968. Private Merlin Alexander Delano, 18, Bath, 17 March, 1966. PSC James Richard Dufall, 21. I played baseball with him. Berwick, 22 June 1966. Staff Sergeant, excuse me, Sergeant John Wallace Knight, 25, Berwick, 1 January 1968. Somebody said, once said, Somebody said once said. Somebody once said you die twice. You die when your heart stops and you, your soul goes to where your religion takes you. You die the second time when your name is no longer mentioned. Hopefully I say 40 more people today. Thank you. Please all stand. Hey! Ready? Low! Hey! my attention by someone who I work with and uh, it was about her uncle and it's quite a quite a sh nice little story but it also um, tells a lot about why we're here today. Imagine this, a young local marine is deployed to 
to the hot, punishing jungles of Vietnam during the war, serving 13 months in a foreign land thousand miles from home, thousands of miles from home. He returned stateside safely, only to be deployed a second time, back to the blistering heat and dense forested highlands. On this deployment, he is captured by the enemy, tortured and imprisoned. After nine months, he escapes, returns home, and remarkably deploys for yet a third time to Vietnam. Already Master Sergeant Louis T. Shanes has quite a story, but his real life tale is only just beginning. On that third tour, DeShaney's fellow Marines were patrolling the streets of a small village after a night air raid and bombing. They came across a local orphanage and saw nearby, underneath debris, and wrapped in weathered canvas clothing, a small baby girl. DeShaney's lifted the infant from the debris and was told the infant's name was Lucia, translated into Eng English, autumn perfume. For the next year, he would return to the orphanage to check on the baby, eventually deciding, along with his wife, to adopt her and bring her home. On 3 July, 69, Louis Deshaines and his now daughter, renamed Cindy, arrived at Boston Logan Airport. I would, quote, I was the set, this is Cindy talking, I was the second baby to be adopted from overseas to the United States. I feel honored to be given the opportunity and blessed for having two parents who loved me and brought me into their family in Leominster, says Cindy Shanks. My dad passed 17 years ago due to Agent Orange from his service in Vietnam. He was only 74 years old and my girl. Pastor. I want to thank Sergeant Dundell who just met these names. That's the first time. Done. I've read the name to them in the magazine, but I've never heard them share it like this in a ceremony. <clears throat> and he didn't get a chance to reach the name of a young man that I went to high school with, ran cross country with Paul Sudbury Jr. But Paul was in the Marine Corps. He came over shortly after I was there in 1966. And he died a few months later doing maneuvers across the rice paddies in northern Vietnam, towards North Vietnam. Stepped on the landmine. But I knew him, his parents well. And I thank you for reading that today. So let's bow for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of those who served and those who gave their lives that we can have this freedom in this country. It's incredible. 
May we never take it for granted. May we always honor those who have gone on before us, who have died to pay the price, and many who are alive today who are still struggling from different things that have had the effects of no war. God bless them. God bless their families, their children. And God bless us as a nation. Help us to do the right thing, Lord, in respect and honor for you and for each and other, and especially for those who serve that country well. We're grateful and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you all for coming uh, and, and, and helping make this the kind of day that it should be. Uh, thank you for our speakers. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you, Pastor Brown. And uh, I, I just want you to know that uh, this isn't just for us, but this is for all of them, every single one. And God bless you all. Post 79, Charles S. Hash out of Burwood was going to do something, and I wanted to do, I wanted to be part of that. I've always been an active member of the Post, but I said, I want to get into that up to my neck if I can. And what can I bring to that? And I started looking at all the soldiers from the state of Maine that never came home from Vietnam, and 119 hamlets and villages and cities and towns that lost loved ones. And to each one of them was a great loss. And I says, just give me some time. I can't do the whole state in one year, but if I can do 44 a year in seven years, I'll start again. And it was an honor. It's always been an honor to put on my uniform. Uh, I never tire of it. If it's got anything to do with soldiers, I'll be there. But I had a real soft, soft spot doing the research, the names. It's, it's all available. It's just you got to go get it. it. Must have been extremely emotional. Yes, it was. It was today. But it was like I say. I know where they died. I know how they died. And uh, the information they gave today was rank, name, how old they were. It was emotional when I kept seeing 19, 18, 22, because I joined at 17, and I'm there. One of the soldiers from Berwick was in country four days. I'm only guessing he never had a bunk. He got off a plane, got on a helicopter, and he went to his unit out in the field. Three, four days in country. And that's, that's always torn me up. 
Well, in 75, when I went in, it had cooled down a little bit. Now it was all volunteer army. So I volunteered. I wasn't drafted. Um, and the travels I did in 75, it had cooled down a lot because they had, they had ended it. In 73 was the last troops pulled out and that's when they got the uh, POWs back. So it had cooled down for two years and you know, that will do it. The only reason I know, because they didn't report that on the news, is I served with the guys that come home. And during the Gulf War, Persian Gulf War, and uh, Afghanistan, you know what? You went as a unit, and you came home as a unit. During Vietnam, they draft you. You were sent over there as one. You did your time with people you never even trained with, with people you never met. And then when you had done your year, you came home as one. It wasn't a whole plane load like they do nowadays, whole units, whole battalions. You came home as one, and you had to go through the airports as one. And uh, I, I, I've i always carried that burden of my friends telling me that stuff. And today, I got a little bit of that burden lifted. Like I said, I think I did some good. Thank you.